The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message by Pastor Ivan Blake. That afternoon, two followers of Jesus left Jerusalem to go to the little town of Emmaus. As they walked along, they talked about all the things that had happened. Suddenly, they realized someone was behind them. They asked him to join him, them. Jesus did, but he did not let them recognize him. He asked, why are you looking so sad? Cleopas answered, don't you know what happened in Jerusalem this week? You must be a stranger because everyone is talking about it. Jesus said, tell me what happened. They asked, haven't you heard Jesus about Jesus? He was a mighty prophet. He worked all kinds of miracles and preached God's good news everywhere he went. But the priests and leaders turned him over to the Romans and crucified him. We were hoping that he was the Messiah, that he would free us, our country, and then set up his kingdom. But today is the third day since he died. Besides that, some women went to his tomb this morning and found it empty. His body was gone. They said that two angels appeared to them and told them that Jesus had risen. But no one believes it. So the disciples checked out the story. They also found the tomb empty. But they didn't see Jesus anywhere. Jesus said, I'm sorry to hear that, but there's no reason to be sad. You need to believe what the prophets predicted. They said that the Messiah had to die before he set up his kingdom. Then Jesus told them in detail what Moses and the prophets had predicted would happen. He knew that they needed to be put their needed to put their faith in what the Bible said about him and not just in his being alive. Thank you, Natalie. We begin a new series today called the 28 Revelations of, of Jesus. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you that the tomb is empty. That story we've read, the tomb is empty. Now our hearts will not be empty. We'll be filled with your presence because Jesus is alive. We pray that your spirit will please resurrect a new sense of the living Christ in our hearts and minds. For Christ's sake, I pray this. Amen. What is in your heart right now? Only what is really important, what really matters to you, will be in your heart. Is your heart at rest, filled with peace, confidence, assurance? Is your heart right with God? What God wants to do for us today is to fill our hearts. It's really the heart that matters. Externals, no. The heart is what really matters. And we're going to take time today to look into the hearts of two of the followers of Jesus. Why are we doing that? It's because something very real, something very good can happen to our hearts as we look into their hearts. So you may want to take the Bible. There's a Bible in the pew in front of you. It's a black Bible. And if you want to use that one, just go to page 897. No, 879. My dyslexia just worked that out. Just worked that out. All right? Go to 879, page 879. And we'll be looking at Luke chapter 24. Well, it's on the same day that Jesus rose from the dead when these two followers of Jesus, still very convinced that Jesus was dead and that he would remain dead, they left Jerusalem heavy-hearted, sad, unbelievably despondent. And they were walking back to their home village called Emmaus. It was at least a two and a half hour journey, so they had lots of time to talk. And what do you think they talked about? 
Jesus arrested, Jesus tried, Jesus crucified, Jesus buried, and that's it. Why did it happen that way was all they could think about. Despondent they were. The crucifixion of Jesus dashed their hopes. Now they were hopeless. And isn't it true that without Jesus, we're all hopeless? And these men could not have been in a darker place in their lives, in their hearts that moment. The good part is that while they were walking along, they were noticed. They were noticed by Jesus. And they didn't know that. And so the Bible says on verse 15, if you look at that, on Luke 24, verse 15, it says, As they discussed these things, Jesus suddenly came and began walking with them. Why didn't they recognize Jesus? They didn't know it was Jesus. To them it was another traveler. Why didn't they recognize Jesus? Well, the main reason, is, given in verse 16, God kept them from recognizing him. Why is that? Could it be that God knew that there was something very important they had to see first before they would recognize that Jesus is alive? Is it that maybe you and I need to see something just as important while we do not with our physical eyes see Jesus around us, but we can see that very important thing that God wanted them to see and that he wants us to see so they didn't recognize him. Here's a very funny thing that happens. When they didn't recognize him, and they knew this person was among them, he said, Jesus said, verse 17, what are you guys talking about? What's new? What's up? And with that, they stopped in their tracks. They couldn't believe there was somebody who came out of Jerusalem who didn't know what was happening. They couldn't believe that. And so they said to him, you must be the only guy, the only person who's been in Jerusalem these last three days and didn't know what's going on, what was happening. Where have you been? Now notice the irony of this. Jesus was in fact the only one who really knew what was going on in Jerusalem those three days. But more than that, he could have said to them, where have you been? I've been to that dark pit of God-forsakenness and back. Where have you been? He doesn't scold them. He doesn't belittle them. He meets them where they are. But let me ask you this. Do you like it when you hear people talking about you? It's kind of a curious thing, wouldn't it? And that's exactly what Jesus did. So he says to them, what things are you talking about? And then Jesus gets to listen to two lost souls talking about Jesus. Oh, that must have been interesting. And they talked. The Bible tells us. Well, yeah, they say the things that happened to Jesus, that's what we're talking about. The man from Nazareth, they identified him because they thought, this man doesn't even know what's going on in Jerusalem. We better identify Jesus where he comes from. Jesus from Nazareth, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was mighty in teaching. In fact, they said, in the eyes of God, he was mighty. In the eyes of the people. He was mighty in his miracles, in how he taught. But in verse 28, verse 20, but our leading priests, ashamed to say this, and our religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. Well, how do you put to death somebody who raised people from the dead? It was hard for them to understand that. Verse 21, we had hope. What's your hope today? We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. Stop for a moment. Key word, rescue. The Greek word for that is lutron. Everyone say lutron. Good Greek scholars. You know what lutron means? It's not just rescue. That word lutron tucked into that word 
combined in that word is the price you pay for rescue. There's a cost involved. And if the rescue is to rescue from sin, then the cost, the price, is a blood sacrifice. They missed that. They looked for a rescue from the Romans. They saw the word. They knew the word. The word actually is better translated in English as ransom. Some Bibles actually put that in. Because in ransom, there is a price to be paid. And the price was the precious blood of Jesus. Now, these two men, followers of Jesus, they knew a lot about Jesus. A lot about Jesus. They even knew the word, lutron. They knew it. But they didn't know what it meant. They knew the doctrine. But they edited out the point of the doctrine. They inserted their own opinion. And then missed out on the crucial thing that would make them see Jesus. Now they were blind. They were blind. Now let's stop here for a moment. And, and just think about this. I mean, these two followers of Jesus, were they sincere? Did they have the facts straight? Did they know the Scriptures? Were they informed by the doctrine of Scripture? Yes, yes, yes. In fact, they would not have been so upset about the fact that Jesus was buried and that he was dead in their minds. They would not have been as upset about that if it wasn't that they were students of Scripture because in the Bible, they read the prophecies that pointed to the fact that a Messiah would come and rescue Israel. They found it in Scripture. And when Jesus showed up, they scrutinized him and they measured him according to what they understood Scripture taught. They knew the doctrines of Scripture. They lived correct lives because of the doctrines in Scripture. But their doctrine didn't connect them with Jesus. They even knew a lot about Jesus. But they were not connected to Jesus. Something was missing. What was it that was missing? What was missing left their doctrine dead and dry. Let me switch that around. What was missing left their doctrine dry and dead. What was missing left their doctrine dry and and dead. Didn't say their doctrine incorrect, but dry and dead. Just like a candle without a flame, just like a car without gas, just like food without flavor, dry and dead. Their doctrines from the Bible help them to know about Jesus without being connected to Jesus. And their doctrine left them, left their hearts hopeless. Right doctrine, hopeless hearts, not a good combination. Something is wrong. Can you see? Can you see that these followers of Jesus really desperately needed more than correct doctrine? Can you see that? Now, we need to stop for a moment here and just talk about this thing called doctrine to understand what is going on here because this word doctrine has become a very complicated, uncomfortable, and a very negative word. So much so that many want to just cut it out of their lives. I hope, I pray, that the Holy Spirit will convince you, persuade you today that doctrine is important, it is necessary, it is beautiful. Amen. Now, having said that, I know 
what you're thinking. I mean, I know what I was thinking when I used to hear the word doctrine. I would think of these stuffy professors that spend their time arguing about minor points of religion, which they make major points. You know, the reformers, maybe you didn't know this, but the earlier reformers in the 15, 1600s, one of the things that they really argued a lot about and they just couldn't settle in their minds and they debated endlessly about was whether it was correct to chew the communion bread. Now, you and I argue about much more important things than that. That's what doctrine can do. Unfortunately, doctrinal fights are viewed as rearranging the deck chairs while the ship is sinking. Doctrine is very often used as the bludgeon to fix and correct those souls who are wandering off the path of truth. Doctrine is the fuel too often of denominational battles. No wonder vibrant Christians come to the conclusion they want little to do with doctrine. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but it is evident now that for decades and decades that these vibrant Christians who have dumped doctrine, that they have adopted spirituality. It's kind of a nice mantra. Dump, dump doctrine, pick up spirituality. It sounds so spiritual. <laughs> the problem is that in many cases, don't want to generalize, but in many, many cases, that spirituality is very similar to Buddhism. And when you boil down Buddhism down to its rudiments, to its very core, then Buddhism is mostly about self-actualization, self-experience, self-discovery. Do what makes you feel good about yourself. And that is called spirituality. Be mindful. Great word used today. Be mindful. And that is far more satisfying than dry and dead doctrine. It's far more satisfying. So why then would I want you to be persuaded that doctrine is important, that it is necessary, that it is beautiful? Why would I want to do that? Here's why. Because Christ is the center of all true Doctrine. Amen. Christ is the center of all true doctrine. Would you say that with me? Christ is the center of all true doctrine. You see, you can be right. You can have the right doctrine and not be right with God. Until Christ becomes the center of all true doctrine. You can, fa you can focus on the end times. You can focus on how to worship correctly. You can focus on what to put into your mouth and not say much about Jesus at all. If you've been around church for a, a long time, you must have met that person who is right in doctrine, but wrong in focus. Christless doctrine is a steep cliff that many have fallen down. But there's another cliff, equally dangerous, that many have fallen off. There are some who claim, they say, we don't teach doctrine, we only preach Christ. But then you ask those people, well, who is the Christ? Who is Jesus? And what has he done? And they'll explain to you who Jesus is, quoting Scripture even. They'll explain to you what Jesus did, quoting Scripture even. And what they are actually doing is they're teaching you doctrine. 
Because doctrine simply is statements of truth found in Scripture. And because we have given doctrine a bad rap by turning it into a formal, dry, cold, dead thing without Jesus, now the baby's out of the bath, where well, the bathwater is out the window. Let's not do that. Listen, truth and doctrine are never diminished when Jesus Christ is lifted up. Amen. Never. When you lift Jesus up, all truth becomes more important. But nothing is very important until Jesus is lifted up and kept in focus. Please, don't ever think people who lift Jesus up that they are watering down doctrine and truth. Don't ever do that. Because when you make Jesus most important, it makes all Scripture important. See, those people who present doctrine with little bit of Jesus, they actually diminish doctrine. So when you read Scripture, let me ask you, when you read Scripture, do you say, I see truth, or do you say, I see Jesus? Depends where your focus is. Because after all, didn't Jesus say, I am the truth? So Christ-centered doctrine is the only kind of doctrine we need. See? Now, for the next several weeks, we're going to be talking a lot about Bible doctrine. But it's not going to be Jesus and doctrine. It is going to be Jesus in doctrine. Vastly different. Vastly different. And we want to see how that every important Bible topic is a revelation of Jesus and doesn't stand on its own without Jesus. Amen. The Holy Spirit, of course, will have to help us. will have to help us to open our eyes that we will see Jesus in Scripture, that we will see Jesus in doctrine. It doesn't happen naturally. It doesn't happen by just reading Scripture. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. It's you know, the only truth that satisfies and changes the heart, the only truth that satisfies and changes the heart is the truth as it is in Jesus. The only one. Now, I'm so glad that Amber this morning told that story about, or gave out Bibles, told the story about Bibles and gave a little tiny Bible that needs a what? A magnifying glass. She didn't know that I was going to talk about that. Except this way. There is a Bible, take it back, there is a book called the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, you can buy it in several volumes, but the Oxford English Dictionary that contains everything English, you can actually buy it, but the problem is that when you open it, the print is reduced so much in order to get it into one book that you cannot read it. And so you'll have to purchase a magnifying glass, but you'll have to get a magnifying glass that's about as big as a plate. And you'll have to put it on a pole so you can swing it over it and look through it, and then you'll need another magnifying glass to magnify what the magnifying glass magnifies, and that will help you to focus on the very word you want to read in English. And that's beautiful because as you bring that magnifying glass into the word, onto the word you want to see, that word just pops into focus. It's as crystal clear. It is bright. It's brilliant. It's, it's beautiful to see that. But you notice something else. That everything else to the side of that focused word is blurry, fuzzy. It's in the margins. And you know what that analogy says? is when the Holy Spirit gives us eyes, becomes the magnifying glass, gives us eyes to see the Scriptures, it will focus on Jesus. And you'll see Him clearly. You'll see Him brilliantly. You'll see Him beautifully. And all the other issues that people talk about and get hung up about and get excited about and want to crucify each other about, they're in the margins. They'll be fuzzy. They will not make much sense when Jesus is 
the focus. So thank you, Amber, for that story. What is it that those hopeless disciples, followers of Jesus, that they missed that was so crucial? Go back to verse 25. Are you still there? In Luke 24, Jesus said to them, You dull of mind and slow of heart to believe. I wonder if Jesus would say that to me today, if he looked me in the eye. When Jesus listened to my burdens, my issues, looked into my heart, and I'm a follower of Jesus, will he say to me, you dull of mind, you slow to believe? It's an insult. It's not a compliment at all. Jesus was so burdened that these people will see what they're not seeing. And he was willing to really say it loud and clear. And then he said, here it is. Here's why you're dull of mind. Here is why you're slow to believe. You find it hard to believe all. You believe some, but to believe all that the prophets wrote in the Scriptures. And we're wondering, what is that all Jesus is talking about? What is that part missing? You know a lot about Jesus. You know a lot about truth. You know a lot about the teachings of the Bible. What is that all that they are missing? And here Jesus gives it. Here's the pinnacle. Here's the core. Here's the clinch in verse 26. Jesus says, wasn't it clearly predicted? It was so clear, why didn't they get it? It was clearly predicted that it was necessary, that word means essential, for the Messiah to suffer. To suffer all these things before entering his glory. They wanted the glory, but not the suffering. Even though the words were in Scripture, they missed it. Like us, those disciples believed in a Jesus that would make their lives better. Just look at all, most of our prayer requests. It's to make our, prayer, our lives better, isn't it? And like us, those disciples knew little of the Christ who came not so much to make their lives better, but to make their lives holy, connected with God, purified of sin, image of God restored in them. How much of our prayers contain that? And Jesus was saying to them, you cannot understand me, you cannot know me, you cannot experience me unless you understand that my suffering is what I'm all about. My suffering is the only way you can have a holy life and that holy life is the only thing that matters. Everything else will pass away. The holy life will stay. I'm here to make you holy. And I'm here to make you holy through my suffering, through my paying the, the, the ransom, to pay the price, that ransom for a condemned humanity. I came to pay that price. And it was paid by my blood. And to enter into my glory simply means that I will bring to my Father my sacrifice and He will accept it. And when He says, I accept it, he will instate me at the right hand of his throne, and I will then continue to minister holiness to you. Do we get that? That's what they missed. Because the pinnacle, friends, of prophecy in Scripture, the pinnacle is the sufferings of Jesus. It's threaded throughout Scripture. You take the thread of the blood of Jesus, his suffering out of Scripture, and all you have is another book to put on the shelf in the library and never look at it ever again. The blood of Jesus is what makes the Bible holy, different to all other books. That's the issue. We must be busy with. 
That's the issue we must be focusing on. While there are tons of other things around to distract us, to bother us, to worry us, worthy things to get involved in, to talk about, to write about, to discuss, to enter on Facebook, unless you're on a Facebook fast, but we'll go into all that kind of stuff, and all that will do is it'll distract you from the focus, which is the passion of Jesus Christ for your holiness. It's a pinnacle of prophecy. And it is this doctrine of the suffering of Jesus, about his suffering, that he wants to put into our hearts because that's the one thing that will transform our hearts. It is this doctrine that Jesus wants us to swallow, to chew on, to digest, to live off. We know, yes, we know that Jesus Christ did suffer. We know that. The question is, it means very little until it changes our hearts and makes us like Jesus. The world is tired of hearing about Christians who believe that there is a Jesus who came and died on the cross and went to heaven and is coming again. The world is tired of that. The world wants to see what a difference that Jesus on the cross is making in their lives so that those people are transformed and are different to the world that doesn't have hope, doesn't have peace, doesn't have harmony, doesn't have victory, doesn't have love among them. That's why I need to focus on the blood of Jesus. That's what they missed. These two disciples, they read through those predictions that told in the Bible told about Christ's suffering. They read it. But they interpreted those passages in a way that would make them feel good. They reinterpreted it. In fact, they also ignored it because if they ignored it, they wouldn't have to accept it. It was too challenging. It was too revolutionary. It was too chain, too much change. And we do the same. Verse 27. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself and his passion. You know, you and I are not given the exact passages that Jesus quoted for them. Remember, it was a two and a half plus mile uh, hour walk that they were on. He could quote many scriptures. He could go all over the place. We don't know where he went, but you know why we don't know where those scriptures are? It's not on a footnote in any Bible at all. It's because he wants us to go back on ourselves, on our own, to study those passages, to search them, to let the Holy Spirit make us land on those places. You know, Jesus didn't just touch on one incidental passage here and there to point out that he was to come as the suffering Messiah. No, Jesus could just point to thousands of places where he could land and say, this is how I am exposed and revealed in Scripture. Jesus found himself everywhere in Scripture. Why don't his followers find him everywhere in Scripture? And the result is the Bible doesn't help us. We're not changed. The Bible doesn't mean that much to us. In fact, we are the same as the rest of the world. Just we, we believe a little more about the Bible, but we are not as changed as the Bible wants us and can change us because of the focus of Jesus. When those three travelers arrived at Cleopas' home, Cleopas is one of the two disciples. When they arrived at home, and as they were turning towards the home, Jesus just kept walking. And they stopped him and says, No, please don't go on. Come in and dine with us. Come and we want to hear more about the exciting things that you were telling us on the road. And Jesus will never decline an invitation for you to ask him to come into your home. Amen. Gladly he went in. Verse 30 says, as they reclined to eat, those days they lay and eat, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. This is a guest, and he's acting like the host. He takes over the meal. What's he doing? Suddenly, 
with bread in his hands, the bread of life, their eyes opened and they recognized Jesus. Let me ask you, who opened their eyes? The Holy Spirit opened their eyes. The same Holy Spirit that shut their eyes on the road so they wouldn't recognize Jesus for good reason, now opens their eyes. And I ask you, has the Holy Spirit opened your eyes? What do you see when you look at Scripture? And they wanted to gaze on Jesus. They wanted to embrace Jesus, but he vanished instantly. But he left them with a beautiful, beautiful secret. And that is that if they, with hungry hearts, invite the Holy Spirit to open their eyes, they could look into Scripture and they could see Jesus in all his beauty. Amen. He didn't have to be physically present. They needed open eyes to see Jesus in Scripture. They realized that the God of salvation had come to dine with them. But he gave himself to them in such a way that they could not only dine with him, but now dine on him. They could dine, feed on Christ in his word, the bread of life, in the word of life. Dine with the divine, and you will dine on the divine, and you'll become like Jesus the divine. <laughs> they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as we took? as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures. What, when did their hearts burn? While Jesus was exposing the scriptures, pointing them to his sufferings all through scripture. That made their hearts burn. That made them come alive. Scripture was now something very different. What was it that Jesus made their hearts burn by? It was looking at his suffering, his teaching. You know, the heart of Scripture is also the heart of doctrine and is also the heart of Jesus. But it needs to be in our hearts. That's where it belongs. That's why he gave it to us. When last did you have your heart burn? Because of what you saw in Scripture of Jesus. It will happen to you. It will happen to you when you read the Bible as if you are dining with the divine. It will happen to you if you read the Bible as if you are dining on the divine. And the Word of God will start to change your heart. Because that's where the change must begin. That's what we need it to do the heart. Dine with the divine, and you will dine on the divine, and you'll become like the divine Jesus. Shall we pray? Dear God, only you know what decision each of us need to make in our hearts right now. What we've heard from your word, we pray that your spirit has spoken to us. Individually, you know where we are. You know what's in our hearts, and only what is most important is in our hearts, and may it be you. May it be a hunger, a yearning, a desperation, maybe recognizing that we are hopeless because we have not been centered in Christ. Lord, make your word uh, come alive as we take time to read it in this time in which we live more than ever. Make Jesus the center of Scripture. His suffering, transforming our hearts and our lives. Teach us what decision you want us each one to make right now. And thank you in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. 
please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you His peace and joy.